it's my honor uh, to be able to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Rupert um, Handgrettinger. I had to practice that several times. Uh, the title of the talk is The Future of Haploidentical Transplantation in Malignant and Non-Malignant uh, Diseases, and there couldn't be a more appropriate speaker uh, than Rupert uh, to give this uh, talk. A brief history, he uh, trained in uh, Tübingen and then uh, was uh, leading the uh, bone marrow transplant program at St. Jude, uh, Jude's Children's Hospital from 2000 to 2005, and then uh, went back to Tübingen where he was the chair of pediatrics as well as heading uh, the division of pediatric hematology, oncology, and stem cell transplantation. Um, he has over, uh, I don't actually, I, when I PubMed him, it said he had 540 publications. I, I didn't verify that every Handgrettinger R was his, but I'm pretty sure that all 540 are. Now, 540 is an incredibly impressive number. Um, it, it highlights his uh, direct productivity, but you don't get to 540 without being a tremendous collaborator and really joining and linking and bringing people together to advance the fields of hematopoietic stem cell transplantation as well as immunotherapy. So, um, and so, uh, you know, nothing more to be said. But what I will say before I uh, turn the podium over to him is, is that the uh, recognition that uh, manipulation of allogeneic grafts, first by uh, doing what we call naked CD34 purifications, uh, recognizing and learning from the strengths and weaknesses of the, that type of haploidentical transplant, and then the development of uh, alpha, beta, uh, T cell, CD19, B cell depleted transplants to address the things we learned, the problems and successes from CD34 naked drafts, uh, naked grafts are uh, why we're here today. So he will, I'm sure, review how we got here, but more importantly, I'm very interested to hear his thoughts on where we're going to go in the future. So uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Handrettinger to the podium. <clears throat> Thank you so much for this very kind introduction. And uh, okay, so these are my disclosures. Of course, I have a better depletion. We had just recently had this very nice paper from uh, the Italy group from Franco <coughs> on the 10 year follow up on the TCR alpha beta depleted haploidentical transplants to treat acute lymphoblastic leukemia. He showed very good data, 10 year follow up now which were very promising. This was, of course, for patients with uh, uh, acute lymphoblastic leukemia, but also some myeloid leukemia. And that led to a very nice editorial, The Rise of Haplo, A Quest for the Perfect Graft. And I think uh, this, this was very nice for me to get this, because this is what I can use maybe to walk you through whether we can go up to the hill. And I don't think we are yet there. But first, I think we have to come to the door. We have not yet gone through the door even, maybe. And the question, but alpha beta depletion has been also used in other centers, not only uh, in, also in Europe, but also in, in Moscow by Michael Marshall at the Dimitri Rogachev Center. They have this data, all alpha beta depletion, they fare better with haplo than with matched unrelated for malignant disease. Large patient number, this one, this is the largest center in Europe, in, in Moscow. And also for patients with non-malignant diseases, excluding skid, they also have a very good outcome on haploidentical transplantation. These are alpha beta. At the moment, they cannot do it because the embargo, that's a problem for them. And how did we get to the door at all? So we went not yet through this door, but how do, did we get in? I think one who started to go direction to the door was, or is Yair Reisner, who you all know, he tried to select stem cells together, of course, with other colleagues, and they used this very uh, early, this soybean agglutination, sheep, red cell, uh, uh, Eros, Evo setting. I think the FDA would get a heart attack nowadays if you would present this or any regulator. But they uh, ma managed it to, to do it, but it, can, it was too cumbersome. I think they couldn't afford the prices for the many pizzas because it took 48 hours to get to stem, to stem cells from bone marrow. 
and was not suitable for large numbers of peripheral stem cells, which then came up. But Yair showed that you can induce tolerance by infusing megadose of stem cells. That, that was his megadose uh, hypothesis. And you can see this here, that these mice who get the megadose of stem cells, they accepted the graft from a black mouse, as you can see here. So of course, this was... They wanted to uh, use this in the clinic, and they started with this method, again, with mobilized peripheral stem cells, where they did first this Eero setting, very tiresome and cumbersome, and then they used this, uh, uh, <coughs> this uh, other assay, uh, which is now off the market, because it wasn't that very effective with a biotinylated anti-CD4 antibody to enrich uh, positive stem cells. But then, fortunately, Stefan Wiltindy came up as a student with the idea to use microbeads, and these are these microbeads, which you all know. You bind these microbeads to the cells, and then you can either positive or negatively select the cells which you want. And I have to say, this was the start of the whole Milton, Milton company, this magnet. <laughs> that was all he had at the beginning. <laughs> this was our first method. Peter Lang, we still know it, Peter. We used this for patients at, in the 90s, uh, to be honest, and then, of course, the development went on and on. Nowadays, we have a more automated and sophisticated machines. And that was the development. Uh, we then did the CD34 positive selection. Our results were so-so. We had problems with immune, uh, with immune recovery. Peter is here in the audience. And then I was at St. Jude as... Uh, as, as was mentioned, and Ray Barfield was a fellow. He worked on the CD3, CD19 depletion, but we were also not that happy with it because the number of T-cells was still high in the graph. So, and then Stanley, also a fellow at St. Jude, we worked on the alpha-beta depletion, and that was finally then the start of this TCR alpha-beta CD19 depletion because it was shown that it was a very effective, reliable method. But now maybe we have arrived to the door, but how do we get through the door? And I think this is the thing we have to think about. We have two methods. Either we go like this guy, and we do a lot of myelar plative therapy and have a lot of collateral damage with it. This is, the, of course, our intensive conditioning. Or maybe we look for the key to go to the door. And I think that would be the more sophisticated way how we can get into this door and into the graft. I think this is the most important. How do we get a graft in without having all this uh, intensive chemotherapy, which might be justified for malignant patients, but not always, but also especially for non-malignant patients, we want to have uh, these extensive myelablative therapies to get a graft in. So can we do it better? And I think the key which we have to get rid of are residual T cells of the patient which survived the conditioning regimen. And we can measure these uh, residual key cells very easily by flow cytometry. And we have done this uh, in this paper, as you can see here. Those patients who had, after, let's say, after 10, 10 days, they still had autologous T cells present at a certain number. You can always be sure they will reject. This is shown here. More than 80% uh, residual T cells within day six post transplant from the recipient, you have a very high rejection rate. And there is not much you can do, to be honest, by intervention of anything. You will rather have to let them inject. Those who have uh, a very low T cell uh, number, uh, they have a good engraftment. Uh, this is recipient T cells from the, from the patient. And how can we detect these T cells? And uh, this is not yet, I think, acknowledged enough. We have a very easy method by flow cytometry. We just use the antibody against the mismatch HLA, either class 1 or B. This is shown here. This is all donor. You see the T cells are mixed T cells, part recipient, part from the donor, and K cells are donor. And you can go into every minor population, even if you have only a few micro, micro through 10, microliter per mi uh, 10 cells per microliter, you can still see them, whether they are recipient or donor. And what also has been not maybe looked, and this is just one example how we follow this patient. We do this now routinely in Haplo. Uh, that we look for mixed T-cell chimerism and also maybe in some patients react with uh, donor lymphocyte infusion. It works very well uh, and similar to the magnetically sorted T-cells and then PCR, but of course the flow is much easier. You have the result in one hour. Uh, very, uh, and then 
What's also not maybe uh, uh, acknowledged enough, you have a very easy method to detect early relapses. You just look for the patient's persistent HLA. You know, this is, for example, a patient who had uh, a AML. This is all donor. The patient was A2 positive. And you see here this little population, which is not from the donor. So what is this? And you can see here, this was the relapse already. So may, with our nowadays knowledge, we would look into this population very carefully, maybe with other markers, and already start to treat this patient because, because he, before he has the frank relapse. So this is also something for AML. The same with acute lymphoblastic leukemia. You see all is from the donor. The T cells are completely donor type, but there are cells which are not from the donor. This is those cells here. When we look at those very clear, these are CD45 dim, this is already the relapse or the MRD. So you have a very, very, very sensitive MRD detection just looking into the recipient HLA uh, receive, uh, residual cells. And then you can look, are they maybe of the malignant or non-malignant phenotype, but it helps you very sensitive and maybe in addition to PCR, you double your sensitivity or you add your sensitivity. So how to eliminate these residual T cells to prevent rejection? That was our original goal in using CD34 selection because you have no T cells in the graft, which might help you to engraft. And that was our original idea to use this Muronomab, the anti-OKT3 antibody starting here to already eliminate or deactivate residual T cells. Then we give the a depleted graft, and this time the CD34 selected, and also to keep the residual B cells because we still see them after engraftment. We see them here. Also to keep them under control, we gave this Moronomab over a while, and we had good data with that approach. Unfortunately, they took the Moronomab off the, tar off the market because there was not enough business. I think our hospital and one other were the only one who still bought it from them. <laughs> because it was used in kidney transplant, but then the other tracks came up, so they took it off the market. So we had to replace it with, OK, with ATG. And then that was our conditioning regimen with ATG. But the ATG has a problem, and we all know the problem of ATG. And this is this one. This was just, by, or is just impressed by Philip Meyer from, from Peter Lang's group from Tübingen. You see here, when we give a low dose of ATG, the rejection risk is high. If we increase the ATG dose even to 60 mg per kg, we have a low rejection risk because we eliminate these recipient T cells. But the problem is the immune recovery. <clears throat> the higher the ATG dose, the poorer is your T cell recovery, as you can see here. So this is something you have to keep in mind, uh, that you have to have this balance between high ATG, low rejection, and then very poor recovery, where you lose my patients at the end due to the infections. These patients rarely have T cells at all if you use a high uh, ATG, if you use uh, like 60 milligram high ATG dose, you can see there are almost no T cells, even at day 90, almost no T cells. So these patients are very immunocompromised if you do that. So, and this is, the, of course, uh, the, the question, can we achieve high ATG levels? This is what we want to do. Uh, but, uh, this was the higher levels, of course, the higher dose gives the higher levels. This is the 60 milligram. Then, but they stay longer, and this leads to the pure immune recovery, but it would prevent our rejection. So, so is there something we can use to uh, stop the ATG at that time before we infuse the stem cells? Fortunately, the answer is yes, there is something. This is what we are actively looking now. There is an enzyme which is called Imlifidase. This is an enzyme from Streptococcus biogenes. <coughs> it was published many years ago, and it targets and cleaves human IgG. And so here at the hinge, uh, it cleaves human IgG. And this is now approved, conditionally approved, uh, for the treatment of hyperacute uh, humoral kidney rejection you know, to cleave the anti HLA antibodies in the patient because it leaves antibodies. So when I heard that, I went to the company and asked, does it also leave other things like ATG? Or They didn't know, so we did the experiments in Tübingen. The answer is yes, it inactivates ATG. This is, for example, T cells incubated with ATG. You have good viability. There are no dead cells. Then. Uh, <coughs> If you add, uh, uh, this is without, of course, ATG. If you add ATG, 
uh, your, your viability goes down, as you can see here, and your dead cells goes up, as expected. But if you add this imblifidase, you can rescue some of the dead cells, uh, and you can risk the, the viability here, as you can see. And also for lower doses of ATG, you can do the same. So it inactivates the ATG to some extent. But ATG is a monoclonal antibody, of course. Maybe a, uh, it's a polyclonal antibody. We really don't know what works inside there. So uh, maybe a monoclonal antibody would be better. So we did the same with Compass. And all of you know Compass. Some like it, some don't. I think in the UK it's compulsory to use it. <laughs> right? <laughs> But it has also some problems because it's highly effective. It kills T cells very nicely, but it stays around for a long time. It leads to the same immunodepletion. Since it's a monoclonal antibody, it was very interesting whether imblifidase would also do the job. And the answer is yes, it does. This is uh, cells without anything, good viability, no dead cells. Then we give Campath. You see 90% uh, of the cells are killed by incubation with Campath. If we inactivate the compass with the imlifidase, all of the cells stay viable. That means, and also with lower doses of compass, still very effective. That means with the imlifidase, we can rapidly inactivate compass. And this is exactly, I think, one uh, strategy which we could envision in a conditioning <coughs> protocol. And hopefully somebody, or we, or somebody maybe who are interested uh, Will, will help us to do this, you, you, can, you could give compass here, and even in a high dose, don't worry, you just inactivate it. And you eliminate all these residual T cells, which might help you also to reduce the, the conditioning regimen, especially for non-malignant diseases, where you really want, uh, want to save uh, toxicity. With malignant diseases, it might be a little bit different, but to overcome, to go through this door, I think this is a interesting approach. Another approach, I think, is also uh, what we learned from post -Sci. You all know the post -Sci, that you give your transplant with the T-replete bone marrow or stem cells, then you give post -Sci, and this post -Sci then tolerizes the donor T cells at day three and four. So this is what we have learned from the, from the Leo Lutznik and Ephraim Fuchs from uh, Baltimore. Very nice work and of very important and widely used. But we were hypothesizing, can we also do the opposite way? Can we tolerate recipient T cells with the post -sci? Why would the post -sci know what is recipient, what, what is donor? It, it's tolerized. Whatever T cell is activated, it will tolerize it. So uh, we hypothesized that we give here alpha beta depletion T cells. And here we give uh, post -sci. The post -sci have only to take care of the alloreactive recipient T cells, which are surviving the conditioning regimen. <coughs> And, uh, <coughs> and just with a case report, if we have uh, done more patient with a case report, just to show that it's possible, this is a, a patient who had a very uh, uh, non-classified yet uh, immunodeficiency, very reduced conditioning. She had a lot of infection, bowel disease, lung function. She was really sick. and. She was looking for some, a center uh, which would transplant her. She traveled around the world. Nobody said this, this patient is too sick for haplotransplant. Also, we thought she's too sick, right, Peter? She's too sick for this. So we offered her, her father was a doctor, so we could talk to him also. And we offered him maybe to try this approach, to give this low-dose ATG. We give this flutarabine. We gave a low-dose TBI, and then this alpha-beta depletion and uh, post-transplant cyclophosphamide to tolerize her T cells, which we think we would, we, we would not uh, eliminate completely here, and she would reject. <coughs> and this is the analysis. Of course, we used our anti-flow cytometry to detect for chimerism. She had a very rapid increase of T cells, but they were all autologous. So all autologous T cells. Uh, they uh, survived the conditioning, these are this one. But then obviously, and this is our hypothesis, with the post -sci, they were tolerized because then slowly they disappeared, the autologous T cells and the donor T cells uh, recovered. And she had a very uneventful course and uh, this patient is now doing very well. She is complete donor chimera. Uh, has no signs of any of this immune deficiency smear. I, I think Peter, you saw her recently. Right, uh, so she's doing fine. 
And there was an interesting paper uh, and at the ASH meeting. I don't think it was an abstract, just in the papers. And these colleagues do the same. If you look at this, it looks a little bit strange protocol. But they start at day minus from Taiwan. They start at day minus 21. Then they give a low dose TBI, and, they give, and then they give DLI uh, in a haploidentical setting. First DLI, and then they give post, and then they give psi, not post psi, but pre psi. And I think what they do, they they elicit the alloreactivity. They do a mixed lymphocyte culture. So they want the recipient T cells to be activated with this DLI from the donor so they can tolerate them with the cyclophosphamide here. And then they still do an intensive immune uh, conditioning regimen. I'm not sure whether this is necessary. And then they do a TCR alpha beta depleted stem cell transplant. And this is done in thalassemia. And these are their results. Almost no rejection. They only had, I think, uh, two patients, uh, th three patients rejected. Two had another Two could be recovered and one received autologous transfer. That is also showing maybe you can eliminate these recipient T cells, maybe not by intensive chemo, but let them be reactive and then eliminate or tolerize them once you have identified them. We don't have a marker at the moment for identifying them, but we know those who will proliferate after st being stimulated by donor cells. These are your other reactivity, and the, the, I think that the, the cytoxan does this. So this is one idea, for example, which uh, maybe we think about. We do a reduced intensity conditioning. Here I would rather go to COMPATH because it's better with the imlifidase to eliminate and it's more effective than ATG. Maybe a little bit myoablation to get space for the bone marrow. I don't know whether this is possible. And we talked yesterday about a little bit uh, then here. This is one idea we gave hard, half of our depleted graft only to elicit the alloreactivity of the residual recipient T cells and then tolerize them with cyclophosphamide. And if you are worried that uh, your graft will be compromised by phosphamide, you just give the rest of the graft here. I mean, this, these are now some thoughts we have. So you can, you can put these things a little bit together, of course. This monoclonal antibody which you use for TCR alpha beta depletion is a very old one. This was the old so-called BMA031 amurin antibody. It, it was forgotten in the 90s. This antibody has been used for treatment of Kraft versus host disease. And you can see in this old paper that was very effective. Seven patients responded completely because this antibody, what it does, and in the meat, this was then taken off the market, unfortunately, for clinical use. And we, uh, together with the Genzyme company, we created a humanized alpha beta T cell antibody. And this antibody causes activation induced cell death. So if a, a T cell is activated, it sees the TCR alpha beta antibody, the T cell goes into apoptosis. This is shown here. We published this. These are and this is practice control. These are unstimulated with the anti alpha beta. Then we stimulate with CD3, CD28. Uh, uh, and then incubate them with the antibody, anti-alpha beta antibody, you see then the C cells go into apoptosis, also after 40 hours, and they, they do not proliferate anymore. This is also something, of course, which we would like to do to replace our old OKT3 with this TCR anti-TCR uh, anti alpha beta antibody, and I tr trying to convince some maybe companies or whoever to help us to get hold of this antibody. I think that would also have a nice influence to uh, maybe have a, a better graft. And I think if it's too much, you just inactivate it. This is uh, IgG1 antibody, you cleave it, and it will not come back. So this, I think we have the nice tools at hand now. So uh, the question was, can we further uh, identify alloreactive T cells. I think we still want to up go to go up to this hill, you know. And of course, there was the nice work from uh, Seattle, uh, from uh, Dr. Blakely on the CD45 RA depletion. That maybe the cells which cause graft versus host disease are more in the CD45 RA part and not in the CD45 RO. And we also st looked at that. So we did a mixed lymphocyte reaction. Classical, you know, we have the stimulator, the responder cells, and this time the responder cells would, of course, be the recipient cells. In, our, in, in such as our setting, we want to get rid of the recipient cells because all donor cells are depleted by alpha beta depletion in a transplant setting. 
So when we then look uh, and we deplete the CD45RA out of the, of the responder cells, we can reduce the alloreactivity in the CD8 portion to some extent by less interferon gamma production uh, and also in, with the TNF by the CD4, but you see the, uh, by the CD8 subpopulation, but you see in the CD4 population we could not reduce the alloreactivity despite we depleted the CD45RA. Uh, so the CD4, the CD4 are still resistant uh, to this. So we looked at the CD4 expression of these uh, cells, uh, of these acti activated cells, and what we always found a higher expression of CD276, which is also known as the B7H3. It's used as some tumor marker, but it's also somehow a checkpoint inhibitor, which we do not know the ligand yet. Or I don't know whether it's the receptor or the ligand. Uh, the counterpart is not known, unfortunately, but it's always upregulated on the CD4 cells. And when we now <coughs> deplete from the CD4 cells the CD45RA and the CD276, now you can see that we also uh, now reduce the alloreactivity by interferon in the CD4. So we could also, just getting rid of this CD276 positive CD4, RO positive T cells, we could reduce the alloreactivity, but very important, we did not have a uh, change in the response to viral antigen. We did not delete uh, uh, virus-specific T cells, and very most important that it's convincing that this is a really an alloreaction is that the response to third party uh, is, not, is not impaired. So this uh, CD4 cells will respond to third party uh, uh, stimulator cells, so it must be a specific alloreactive uh, response. Otherwise, you would also see an unspecific uh, response here in a third party uh, uh, mixed lymphocyte response. So we use this also in the mouse model, of course not in the, reject in the rejection uh, direction, but in the whether it would uh, kill or it would uh, delete graft versus host disease in this DR4 knock in mouse model, a nice model of a mismatched GVHD, where we depleted the CD45 RA positive, CD76 positive memory CD4 T cells, and you can see we could uh, see less, uh, less graft versus host disease. You see here, and this is the total score of some of the GVH elements. But when we did this in vivo, we treated these mice with the CD276 antibody uh, after infusion, uh, infusion of the CD4, CD45 RA uh, depleted CD4 cells. Uh, and then monitoring for graft versus host, you see we could, we could prevent graft versus host disease. This is the patient uh, treated with the anti-CD276 antibody in these mice. They got all the graft versus host disease with the CD4, CD45 RA. So there's a population in the 276 uh, upregulated where we don't know yet what this population means. And it might be worthwhile in the future maybe also to include this. This is not, not now that we do a protocol. These are just some outlooks in the future, what I was supposed to do, uh, what we could uh, maybe put together nowadays, what we have at, at hand at least to get rid of the recipient T cells. And this is the major, the major uh, task to go through that door, to come to the mountain. I think this is very important. And this is the problem. These results from Franco, which are extraordinary, also from Moscow, they were, of course, obtained by TBI. And this is not, I think, for all patients the best way to have a, a lot of collateral damage. We know that what TBI is doing to children, starting from IQ decrease to other side, long-term side effects. So this is, I think, we, we need to really think uh, to get better at this. And this is why we also think that this haploidentical transplant uh, can be a platform to rescue patients to, or to prevent relapses. Because, of course, with TBI, we might not get that many relapses. But whatever we do, we always have 25% relapse. Match sibling, match unrelated, haplo, it's always. Maybe Peter later, later will show data a little bit with more relapses in the alpha beta depletion. But uh, in the classical transplant, it's always 25%. So we have to also overcome this 25%. This is not good. We don't want to have uh, for, uh, one fourth of the patient having relapses. So what can we do? And uh, we just recently published our data in neuroblastoma, where we used the haploidentical transplant to 
supply the patients with a new immune system. And this is also there you don't have a lot of rejections because the immune system of these patients is so bad. Chemotherapy, all patients had an autologous transplant, they have no T cells anymore left to reject a graft on the so it's very easy to get a graft in in these patients. These were patients with refractory relapse neuroblastoma stage four, and they treated them with an antibody to activate the NK cells of the new immune system, of the donor-derived immune system. And you see our results are quite good. We have event-free survival follow-up of seven years now of 50% uh, of, uh, around. We did a similar approach with a monoclonal anti-CD19 antibody. This is a patient who relapsed after matched unrelated transplant and then uh, was refractory, as you can see here, by MRD, by flow and by PCR. Then we did a haplo identical transplant on him and then treated him with an anti-CD19 antibody to activate the NK cells and also gamma delta T cells, which also can do ADCC. And this is our result. This was not a randomized study, but these patients who received the antibody after second transplant, these were all patients who relapsed after a first transplant, got a second haplo transplant, or four patients had relapsed after a second MUD transplant and got a third haplo transplant. And if you treat them uh, uh, like a maintenance therapy for longer, you get quite a better uh, 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 suppression or less relapses, as you can see here. And now we just started a, a clinical trial with tafacitamab. Peter is the PI and his colleagues in Tübingen. If you are interested, talk to Peter. Tafacitamab is now an anti-CD19 antibody approved uh, for the treatment of diffuse large B-cell lymphoma in combination with uh, Lenalidomide and these patients will get one year of antibody treatment with this tafacitamab. I think the first patients are already uh, have been treated so far, I think, uh, okay. And when we do this alpha beta depletion, of course, we have this uh, in K cells and gamma delta cells in the graft also. So what do we do with these cells? And this is what we work with uh, Jose and his team in Miltony now, that we uh, work on a program that we don't throw these cells away, but we culture them in a, in a, in a uh, closed system, uh, namely the prodigy. So you can culture these gamma delta T cells. You need bisphosphonates, cytokine. This is all clinically available. This is only solectronate, IL-2, and IL-15, and the, and the prodigy program. And then you can uh, cultivate these gamma delta cells up to 300-fold, uh, which is not uh, the, it's done alone by the prodigy now. This would be all a platform maybe to do like a gamma delta donor lymphocyte infusion after transplant. And if you are interested in NK cells, I know if you are interested in CAR T cells, you can easily uh, transduce these CAR T cells with the baboon vector. This is the classical vector. We don't see a good transduction of gamma delta T cells with the classical vector. If you would use your lentigen vector with CD19, you would get this result, maybe 5-10% transduction. With the baboon vector, we have now in the range of 90-95% transduction. Also with CD33, we did it. And these cells are also very active, as you can see here. And this is very nice because the, the, the gamma delta cells not only have then an anti-car activity, they also have a native like an NK-like activity, they kill in addition. Even if the car is not so effective, they still kill, like NK cells. So that's something, and if you are interested in NK cells and want to expand not only gamma delta T cells, you just add IL-18 into the mix. In the prodigy, then you get a mixture of gamma delta and, and NK cells, but the gamma delta, uh, the alpha beta T cells are gone. You almost don't see any gamma uh, alpha beta T cells. So that would be also something for using in a post-transplant immune setting either to prevent relapses or to boost the immune reactivity because gamma delta cells, I think we will hear later, also play an important role also in fighting infections, not only in tumor. So what about donor CAR T cells? And this is, uh, I think, also for the future. We, we had this patient uh, coming from Saudi Arabia to us with very severe toxicity after conventional therapy. She, we had her half a year on the floor. We couldn't do anything. Refractory disease. Then we tried autologous CD1922 cars. Did not work. A boost did not work. She was refractory. 
Then we did a T cell depleted MAT transplant, which we would never do when a patient is not in remission, uh, but with the idea to give her donor CAR T cells. So from this graph, we made already donor CAR T cells, we froze them, and then we did a transplant. She had a very good uh, ex vivo expansion of these donor CAR T cells the first 100 days, as you can see here. Then she went back to Saudi Arabia. So we haven't heard a long time from her. So I was there a few months ago and visited her. And also to my, uh, this was the outcome after the, this was four weeks after mud transplant. She progressed eight weeks after mud transplant. And this was not only lymphoma, this was all over the body. And then four weeks after the donor CAR T cells, she cleared everything. Then she went back to Saudi Arabia. We lost her a little bit from the follow-up, but I was recently there. She's still in remission, complete remission. I met her, and to my surprise, this is still her CAR T cells. Three years after transplant, she still has about 25% of her CAR T cells. Of course, she has no B cells. That's why she needs routinely the IVIG, but that keeps her in remission. So very interesting. Of course, and we will discuss this later, will gene therapy replace allotransplant in hemoglobinopathies? Of course, uh, Tübingen took part in the CRISPR trial, and we all know the data and have seen them, that it takes quite some time to increase the neutrophils in some of the patients, which is much faster in transplant. So my answer is, wait a little bit, maybe not. If we can softly open the door, uh, better and use a key and not uh, you know, the police uh, approach to open this door. And I think by tolerizing the recipient T cells, I think this must be our goal for these non-malignant diseases to get a graft stable in. And I think we have now the, the material, we have maybe this imlifidase, we have, uh, have post sci I think this is something we all should still evaluate and think about new ways uh, to, uh, to approach. Transplant and also, of course, we have also done this in Tübingen, like uh, the group here, uh, and we published also the combination of haploidentical transplant, especially with a moderate immune, moderate conditioning allows you to transplant liver. We have done this in liver. We published, I think there were eight patients uh, from Tübingen. Uh, they had all an indication for a transplant, so it was not deliberately, but that will come like you do it now with kidneys. But my goal is also to do it for gut. I think this is the biggest challenge, that we need a donor immune system to be able to transplant a gut because this is the biggest problem. I don't know those of you have seen uh, patients without gut. This is horrible for these children. You know, I felt always so emotionally attached when we had a lot of these patients with, with no gut you know, who had uh, enterocolitis as newborns. And uh, so I think this is also something we need to do. And of course, we have now the study here, and uh, thanks to Alicia and her, and her colleagues, this comes now into new thinking that we think a little outside the box also and think about how to use uh, maybe a smart transplant uh, to get a donor chimerism. We only want a, a donor chimerism. That's all we want, you know, a stable donor chimerism. Then you can transplant everything from the donor, what the donor does not, use, does not need anymore. And... Uh, and I think this is the look in the future. I think less cytotoxicity and more immunologic conditioning should be evaluated, especially for non-malignant disease. I think HAPLO is a platform for post-transplant humoral or donor-derived immune therapy to prevent the relapses. These 25% relapses are still too much. I think we can do better with more research. And I, I also, I think... Uh, we also have to work still until we find this perfect graph. There are still a lot of questions out there. You know, and I know you also working on regulatory T cells, and there's still a lot to do. So I think we still have a way to go to the to the uh, mountain here. But I think the next is to find the key for this door. And with this, I thank all the collaborators and you for your attention. So one of the things that came from your talk, but maybe I'd like you to expand on a little bit, is this idea that um, the cell, manipulating the cell graph becomes a platform for adding back different types of cells. So um, maybe expand a little bit more on how you're thinking about how you take the cells that are coming through the column, the cells that are sticking to the column, whether you expand them, add them back, genetically manipulate them, how you're thinking about that. 
I mean, the, the main, main the task to do post-transplant strategies is to avoid immunosuppression. That, that's your only task, what you want to do there. <clears throat> and then, of course, uh, for day, if you infuse the day zero, uh, and then you come maybe once we can uh, expand this gamma delta T cells, all the cells which would not cause graft versus host disease are good cells. The rest is all bad cells you throw away. Gamma delta T cells, there are subpopulations now of gamma delta T cells. We work on V delta 1, gamma 9, uh, even V delta 3. So there are subpopulations which might be more effective. And also in T cell subpopulations, not all of the T cells are alloreactive. This is probably a minor part. At the moment, we only find them in the mixed lymphocyte reaction. We don't have a marker. So if somebody finds a marker, that would be beautiful if we can eliminate them. But that's a, a little bit, I think, the way that we use the graft, not only infuse the cells and then we go home. I mean, the current standard is, or the thinking is, you do a transplant, you do everything, and then you are done. And my thinking is, when you do the transplant, the therapy starts for the patient. It's not the end, it's the beginning. And this is where I want to go. Maggie. I just thought of a couple of things, Rupert, and I'm answering them in my head as you talk. <laughs> um, but so uh, one of the things you've talked about uh, a little bit is, is eliminating TBI. And it's interesting because a lot of the approaches that you talked about um, uh, included at least some TBI, you know, 400 centigrade TBI. And, and we all know how important TBI is in getting grafts. The European data uh, is really clear. TBI was way better than any other approach. Um, so I, I, how do we get there? You know how I'm trying to get there, and that is choosing the patients that don't need TBI. So, you know, NGS negative patients and, and other types of patients where we enhance post-transplant immune recovery probably don't need TBI. But how do, how do we really get there to your uh, less intense approach, approaches and, and make people confident when you're not getting TBI? Mm -hmm. I think, I, think uh, I mean, you answered the question because you published a paper on the TBI that it's not maybe necessary in all of the patients by NGS control, right? The problem is, and maybe this is online, uh, maybe I don't make friends now, <laughs> the, the forum study which showed the TBI is better than non-TBI, I think is a little bit flawed because only the TBI arm was standardized. The other patient randomized to the chemo arm was free. Everybody could do either treosulfan, either busulfan. They could do busulfan with levels, without levels. That was not part of the protocol. And uh, the forum study showed about, I think, 40% survival with the busulfan arm. Nobody has 40% survival with a busulfan conditioning in the past, right? So I think this is a little of a problem that the, 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 in the forum study that TBI was the major thing is that the chemo arm was too poor because it was not well controlled. And now there was a paper out there where they did this in the previous uh, forerunner study of, of, the, of the forum study, they did exactly the same conditioning, 12th grade TBI, uh, VP16. They have now 10, 12% secondary cancer already after 10 years, so I, uh, 10 years now, we will see a lot of secondary cancers. And this is the problem, and I, I think we have to rethink about that. Whether we need this for grade is just, I'm sure you have a lot of other ideas to, to replace that. This is, of course, this is not fixed. This is some sorts I wanted just to throw in to give some ideas also how we could get rid completely of the, uh, we have some ideas to use CAR T cells for eliminating uh, myelopoiesis, and I think you do also a lot here in, St uh, in, 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 in Stanford or in San Francisco where they do a lot of other approaches to get rid of myelopoiesis. So if you, if you find ways, of course, that's why, why we should look for, but we should leave a little bit this, and that's why I wrote, I wrote a paper once, uh, should or could we abandon TBI and ALL, because I fear this will be the standard for the next 20 years. And we will see our cancer rates going up in these children. Yeah. So anything we can do to do that. And, and, and I think what you're, what you're saying is there are so many approaches to manipulate the immune system, to have a truly targeted approach. But, but I agree with you. I think we can do it. Yeah. Chris. Hi. Chris Dvorak, UCSF. Uh, hey. First of all, great talk. 
And I'm really, really bummed that I chose to talk about uh, rejection uh, because it's going to be a really tough act to follow. But um, my specific question was, you really focused on the role of t res residual um, host T cells in rejection. And you had that really nice data about looking at the flow um, after transplant and, and how many were there. What about in residual host NK cells and their role? Can you separate out the two? Because obviously ATG and CAMPATH hit both T cells and NK, but your alpha beta specific antibody won't hit the NK cells. No, it would, would not hit the NK cells, but we don't see NK cells in this early post-transplant uh, setting. Uh, if I don't remember, Peter, do you remember? In the, in the post-transplant, when we do the flow cytometry? No, autologous. Yeah, yeah. No autologous, we don't see. So it's not the autolo autologous, it's only pure T cells uh, which we see. And even if there are 10 or 20 cells per microliter, which, you know, when you're, if you get your white blood cell count, this is always something you cannot measure, but you can see them by flow. And these few cells, this is like the CAR T cells, they will expand like... Uh, in the evening, you, if they are really very alloreactive, in the evening your patient might have already rejected. This is amazing how they can proliferate if they go, if they start some too slow, some, and there is nothing you can do. We just let them reject then and do the other and do another transplant. We try to avoid it, but there is no, to my view, intervention. So this is why I think this this combination. If I think about alpha beta and uh, post sci this sounds a little bit strange, but I think it's not that unlogical, right, to tolerate recipient T cells because we know post sci is effective in this. So, in, and it works. We did some more patients. Uh, we had another patient with an immunodeficiency, which it also worked uh, quite, quite okay. I couldn't show picture because of the, yeah, and uh, so, so I think, so maybe somebody takes that idea and brings it further. <laughs> Another question then. In your experiment, it's clinical experiments where you're giving post transplant immunotherapy, are you seeing antigen escape at the same frequencies as we see it pre transplant immunotherapy? Uh, with, the, with the CD19? And even GD2. <coughs> uh, no, we have not seen a GD2 negative uh, relapse. I don't remember, and we even have now the possibility to GD2 PET imaging with the antibody put to a PET, uh, but we have not seen uh, GD2 negative uh, relapses. We have not seen so far CD19 negative relapses with the CD19 antibody. And of course, we don't have enough patients with the donor cars to see whether they have CD19 negative relapse. But in my view, the future goes anyhow to the 1922 or so I think CD19 uh, is soon maybe obsolete. I would I would really say, and I think the the, the field goes to two two or more cars. Uh, that that's my feeling. Hmm? I might be wrong with this, but I think if it's, you see you saw the in the in the in the real world data which I didn't have here, the, in some of the centers the relapse was fifty percent in the ninety negative relapses. So there's something we need to do. And I know you guys work also on double or whatever. I think that's the future. Yeah, you're, not, you're, you're talking to the right crowd here. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> well, I, I, I scored some points here. <laughs> <laughs> we have no further questions. Let's once again thank Rupert. Thank you.